John Allen, revolutionary, visionary, officer, farmer, and overlooked hero. Born in Scotland in 1747 and raised in the British territory of Nova Scotia, Allen, like others of his time, found himself aligned with those wanting independence from the British crown. For present-day Maine, his participation was crucial. Through his efforts, he kept Eastern Maine for the Americans and worked to secure the support of the Passamaquoddy, Micmac, and other tribes of the region. Our story starts in August 1776, as Allen, with a price of 100 pounds on his head, has just left his wife and five children in Nova Scotia. He traveled to Machias, Maine, where he encountered Colonel Jonathan Eddy, a hot-headed revolutionary about to embark on an ill-fated expedition. Colonel Eddy. Yes, who are you? Colonel John Allen. Ah, uh, Colonel, I didn't mean to speak with you about my campaign in Nova Scotia. Yes, I've heard about it. And? I think it is the poor decision to attack so soon. We have ample supplies. Doesn't matter. You have no numbers, and I can guarantee the Micmacs won't join you in this suicide mission. If you don't listen to reason, then I'll convince the Machias Council into sending you a letter of reprimand. I can assure you, Colonel, you need not to worry. More men will join me as I head into Nova Scotia, and as I understand it, for the final taking, is still under repair from the recent naval attack. This is very easy target. What's the name of the fort? Fort Cumberland. Eddie, my family lives near that fort. If you lose against them, then they will be harmed in retaliation to the supporting locals. So you do realize the importance of taking this fort and giving it to the Americans, don't you? Yes, but Eddie, please, stay here on Oxford of St. Croix. If you wait here instead of attacking, I'll help you in your fight. At least wait at Camp Fellow. Sorry, Alan. I can I must go. According to Maine, a narrative history by Neil Rold, the commander of Fort Cumberland, Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Gorham, declined Eddie's invitation to surrender and in turn called upon Eddie to capitulate. The standoff erupted in battle on the night of November 12, 1776. A surprise attack routed Eddie and the Americans retreated to the St. John River. Reprisals against American sympathizers were particularly fierce near Fort Cumberland. Mary then fled with her children to her father's home, seeking shelter and protection. Mary! What are you doing here? Father, the soldiers came looking for John. They burned the house down. Please, they'll come look in again. Promise me you'll look after the children. Of course I will. Thank you, Father. Open this door in the name of the King of England! What will you do? We can hide. You can run. I'll go quietly, knowing my children are safe with you. Mary did in fact go quietly and was taken by her captors to Fort Halifax in Nova Scotia, where she was held for a period of roughly seven months before being released. Meanwhile, John Allen was experiencing hardship on the Passamaquoddy Bay. The British were not pleased with his actions. 
They believed him to be a traitor and put a price of 400 pounds on his head. Allen narrowly escaped two assassination attempts by British sympathizers. But the British troops and the Americans were trying to recruit the natives to help fight, but John Allen knew just how important the Native Americans would be to defending the liberty of America. He felt that it was important enough to go see General Washington to get approval, and ended up being named Superintendent of Eastern Indians. Shortly after the assassination attempt on him by a Native warrior, Allen decided to become close to the chief and his peoples. He knew that if he befriended them, they would help him go far in the Revolutionary War to defeat the British. Hello, my friend. It has seemed like many moons since we have last met. Yes, indeed. Seems we have some important business. Yes, Chief. This must be your son? Indeed, yes. He is my son, and I brought him here as proof that I will return to the Eastern Front. And when I come back, I will bring you supplies. Oh, and while he's here, will you teach him your people's ways? Yes. We will bring him in as our own and treat him as one of our own and make sure he is safe and happy. Thank you, my friend. You are very welcome, my white friend. Have safe travels and win this battle. Indeed. Farewell. I will. Fort Gates Machias, May 21st, 1782. Dear son, be very kind to the Indians and take particular notice of Nicholas Francis, Joseph, and Old Kukugash. I send you your books, papers, pens, and ink, wafers, and some other little things. Shall send more in two or three days. Let me entreat you, my dear child, to be careful of your company and manners. Be moral, sober, and discreet. Duly observe your duty to the Almighty, morning and night. Mind strictly to the Sabbath day. Not to either work or play, except necessity compels you. I pray God to bless you, my dear boy. A year after Allen's letter to his son, America's war for independence was over. Allen, still a young man of 36, had managed to secure relations with the Wabanaki tribe, who were influential in keeping man for the Americas. As a result of his efforts, he was gifted land, an island at Cops Creek Bay between Lubeck and Eastport, Maine, today called Treats Island but then called Allen's Island, and later land in Whiting, Maine. During the ensuing years, Allen ran a general store on Treats Island, and was a prominent community member in Eastern Maine. There's a memorial that still stands today on Treats Island, and those wishing to remember him and his efforts can visit the site today. <laughs>